We continue in our series in Isaiah, and today we are looking at Isaiah 46, Isaiah 46, and verse 9. And the title is, Indeed, There is No God Like Our God, or else our God is unique. Our God is unique. And we'll go straight into the text uh, 46. We hope to look at 47 as well. But uh, we see Isaiah 46. And this text has been misinterpreted by many. They uh, have all sorts of things to say about it and uh, make all sorts of statements about it some have said that this is talking about the last days before christ shall come or it's a picture of the last days others are saying well this is just a a kind of parable actually this is not just about a parable it's not even just about the people of god in the Old Testament times and Babylon. Indeed, the whole of this book, and if we keep that in mind, we won't get lost. The whole of this book is about God's design for his creation. God's design, his eternal design and plan for the creation in general, but specifically, it's about the church of Jesus Christ. God's design, his plan, his eternal plan, creation and redemption. If we have that in our mind, we won't be asking questions like, oh, what's this got to do with the previous text? Are these verses 1 and 2 bits and ends of the previous text? And then we begin to wander around in the text. But if we look at it as God's design, his eternal design, and every statement is an example of God's design, his desires, his pleasure for this world, and in particular, his design and pleasure for the church of Jesus Christ. If we have that in mind, no problem. This text will be as clear as it can be. And each time we read from the text, God is showing us something about himself and also his church. And so we see in this text God speaking through Isaiah. He speaks to his people and shows them how ridiculous in comparison to himself the gods of Babylon are. But in a way, he's telling his people, look, some of these gods that you have embraced and some of these gods you think are great gods are actually hopeless. They're hopeless. And in this text, he mentions two gods, Bel and Nebo. He says, look at their gods. They're stooping. What does he mean? Well, they're bent over. They're being carried. And the Lord, as it were, mocks the whole idea of worshipping such gods. He says, even the beast is weary. There's a Puritan writer who was saying something about how often 
beasts of burden, horses, donkeys, and so on. How that certain men that use them are such a burden to the beast that it even screams out to the Creator. Why did you make this person my master? Well, in a way, these beasts here are saying, almost crying to the Creator, why do we have to carry these useless things? A burden. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, this beast is a beast of burden, isn't it? But even to the beast, carrying that idol is a burden. And the Lord speaks of these idols. They bow down together. They couldn't deliver the people. They couldn't help. And actually, these gods, they could not turn God's judgment round. And the gods themselves are gone into captivity, captured. remember I told you that story of that uh, those people who went to the police and complained to them that they had been burgled and that some of the property that was stolen were their gods and the police said your gods were stolen oh yes our gods were stolen that's ridiculous isn't it the thing you worship is stolen well, here's the thing here. The thing you worship is gone into captivity, captured. What kind of God is that? Meantime, you're praying to him, deliver me, deliver me. But he can't deliver himself. He can't deliver himself. He can't deliver the people. See, the Lord ridicules the idea of these gods as being gods. And so he turns around to his people in verse 3. Hearken unto me, listen to me, house of Jacob. And it could be to the church as well. He speaks to us as well. We have so many idols in our home. Sometimes we make ourselves idle. These words are spoken to us as well. You carry your gods with you. You carry your tablet with you, your Apple tablet or your Android tablet with you. You worship it. You're on it the whole day. What time have you got for the Bible? Oh, I'll read the Bible five minutes. That's it. Back to my tablet. And the Lord is speaking to us as well. You are bowing down to something you carry with you. And some of us are so caught up in our tablets that we dare not let anyone else touch them. If the children dare touch the tablet, scream out, don't touch it. If they pick up a Bible and carelessly shake it, oh, that's all right. It's the idol. Same thing, isn't it? Where the Lord in verse 3 says, Hearken unto me, O house of Jacob. Why should we hearken to you, Lord? Well, he says, You have been born by me from the belly. When you were in your mother's belly, I knew you. I cared for you. Actually, you were conceived because it pleased me to do so. And so even to the church, there are two aspects. The first is God is the origin of the church of Jesus Christ. But dear friends, God is the origin of your life and my life. He chose the parents that would bear us the exact parents in the exact country with the exact circumstances. And you were brought out into the world by God's pleasure. 
and allowed to grow. And then wonder of wonders, God chooses when exactly you would be saved. How? Who would be sent to declare the word? I remember when I was saved, a tract came through the door. And it so happened that that day, I was going through a period of questioning, questioning things, questioning all the things I was doing, questioning the pleasures I was indulging in, questioning the whole life. What's the point of life? You go to parties, dance all night, listen to all this loud music, you sweat, you get involved in all manner of sinful things. And then the next day, you're sad. Maybe you throw up even. What's the point of that? Every Friday, same cycle of misery. What's the point of that? And then you come to die. What a waste of a life. Ah, but when the Lord saves, dear friends, he brings his word to bear. And there I was, in the midst of questioning, a tract goes through the door. I pick it up. And I'm drawn to the Bible in the home. I've never, ever looked at it. And lo and behold, I'm drawn to John, the book of John, and begin to read from the beginning. And he's beginning to speak to me. And I'm beginning to realize I need God. I need Christ. Where am I going to go? And the Lord leads me and directs me. And that, dear friends, is not a story or an account of just one person. Millions and millions of Christians have had that experience where God has led them to come to that point where they've had to think about their state before God and to realize that they're wretched sinners. How did that happen? God says, hearken unto me. I bore you from the belly. I carried you from the womb. And even to your old age. Isn't that wonderful? To your old age. God doesn't abandon you at any one time. And sometimes as Christians, we feel abundant. God has abandoned me. I'm not getting married. God has abandoned me. I don't have a job. God has abandoned me. I'm ill. I've been told I've got a terminal illness. I'll be dying soon. God has abandoned me. No, he never has and never will. He says here, and we can claim this promise, and even to your old age, I am he. And even to whore heirs, heirs, will I carry you? I have made, and I will bear, even I will carry, and will deliver you. See, God will do it. I love the way he says, I, 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 only God will do it. And there's only one God who can do that. No other God can do that, dear friends. What a wondrous God he is. And the Lord speaks on and on about this God's, this false God's in verse 7. They bear him upon the shoulder. They carry their God with them. He doesn't carry them. Their gods don't carry them. They carry their gods. How ridiculous is that? And set him up. And their God doesn't move. 
And when they pray to him, silence. And the Lord says this. He will not save you out of your trouble. Your God cannot save you out of your trouble. The Babylonian God couldn't save the Babylonians from the eternal God. Useless gods. And the Lord says in verse 9, Remember the former things of old to his people. Do you remember I created the world? Do you remember I judged the world? Do you remember I brought Abraham out from godless, a godless nation? And then I led him out and through Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and through Judah I have David the king. But even before then, you think of Moses and how God uses him to lead the people out. God crushed Pharaoh's kingdom. God has crushed many kingdoms. No one could withstand this God. But dear friends, the Lord says to us as well this morning, remember the former things of old. Remember what I took you from. I saved you from. And he says, For I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. Our translators have added some words for ease of reading. But really it should read, For I God and none else. God and none like me. He is God. He declares the end from the beginning. He's ever present. It's a difficult concept for us to understand. But this is our God. He says in verse 11. Calling a ravenous bird. That is Cyrus the king. From the east. The man that executeth my counsel. Cyrus might have been doing what he was doing for his own benefit, but actually behind it is God moving him, allowing him, permitting him to do what God would have done. I've spoken, I will also bring it to pass. I've purposed, I will also do it. This is a wonderful promise for us. Whatever God has promised in our lives, in his word, for our lives, that he will do it. He will bring it to pass. Hearken unto me, you stout-hearted, that are far from righteousness. He's speaking to his people here. His people often, they lose their way. And God is saying, be wise. Think again. Don't lose your way. Be near to righteousness. And he speaks of his righteousness in verse 13. And in verse 47, we're not going to read through all that, but he describes there what he'll do to Babylon, bring it down, proud Babylon. And dear friends, we've got enough time to just quickly look at two points from this text. First of all, this text tells us that our God is independent and self-existing. Secondly, that our God is almighty. We belong to an independent and self-existing as well as almighty God. Dear friends, Next time you look at a mirror and say it quietly because people might wonder what's going on with you. But whisper and say, I belong to an independent, self-existing, almighty God. We often forget 
it's good sometimes to speak out aloud. This is my God. This is he whom I worship. He's independent. He doesn't depend on anyone. God has never needed anyone to be or to do. And that should be a lesson for us. First of all, when circumstances are difficult and trying, we should never ever think, God can't do it. This is too impossible for God. Remember, he's not dependent on anyone. He wasn't made by anyone. He wasn't made at all. This concept is so difficult for us to understand. And that's reasonable. We cannot comprehend this God. Because we're used to the idea that anything that is has a beginning somewhere and an end. We're used to this idea that anything that exists and anyone that exists must depend on something else for their existence. But God, he doesn't depend on anything. He has no beginning. Always has been. Always is. Always will be. He doesn't depend on any energy source to keep going we depend anything that is living depends on energy sources but it's not just living things other things as well think of the sun the sun depends on a source of energy and any other star it depends on something else depends on god God depends on no one. Everything else depends on God. The planets, galaxies, the whole universe depends on God for its sustenance, for its keeping. If God were to stay away for a second from his universe, everything would collapse. This is the God we worship. What a great God he is. He doesn't need anyone or anything. But this is the beauty of it. He doesn't need anyone. Oh, but he says of us, we are his people. We belong to him. He loves to have fellowship with us. But God, he don't need anything. Oh, but I love them. I've loved them with an everlasting love. Way back in eternity. But we don't know way back when. It's beyond way back. He loves his people. And he wants them with him. Not for one day. Not for one week. But for eternity. To be with them. And dear friends, not to be with him as slaves no his children to be with his son jesus christ reigning in glory what a god this is he doesn't need anyone or anything and yet it pleased him to draw feeble fragile sinful wicked people to himself Oh, dear friends, this should make us shout out, Hallelujah, glory be to God. And this God, from this text, 46 and 47 of Isaiah, we see a God who does as he pleases. Nothing can stand in his way. He will do what he has set out to do. In his plan, 
And that should be a comfort for us. Because when we rest in God, when we see Him as the all-sufficient one, when we see Him as a vast and measureless ocean of being, we rest regardless of our circumstances. We never panic in any situation whether we are parents whether we are brothers sisters children but dear friends especially for us as a church never panic whatever happens to us as a church whether it's the church itself as a group or individuals in the church never ever panic but also you know it means what it means is this I can always run to God and pray because I know he holds all things. I know that he does as he pleases. I know that every circumstance that comes my way is because it pleased him to bring that circumstance. So, dear friends, we can rest in our God, in his independence, in his self-existence. Is there anything that you're going through this morning that's causing you to think, I can't handle it. I can't do this. This is too much. I'm overwhelmed. Well, you have a God. The self-existing, independent God who is pleased to take you through what he will take you through. And in the end, there's glory for you. Glory! He loves you more than you will ever know. And dear friends, you can bathe, as it were, as we've said, in that vast and measureless ocean of the being of God. You are in that ocean, as it were, and he won't let you drown. He holds you up, always. And he will hold you up to your old age, we are told, even to your old age. How wonderful is that? When you're frail and helpless, hopeless even, and at some point you're lying on your bed, unable to help yourself, and perhaps you feel to yourself, I can't bear this, but the Lord says, I'll be there with you. I'm carrying you. Even at your weakest point. And so, dear friends, what a God we worship. Indeed, we should pray and praise him. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise him, for he is your help and salvation. Secondly, dear friends, this God, from this text, we see the almighty God. Think of Babylon, such a great nation, the greatest nation on the earth in its time. Wondrous, wealthy, powerful. You can imagine it was like Three or four United States of America lumped up together. Proud, independent, so it thought. Self-existing, so it thought. Depending on no one, so it thought. Powerful, almighty, so it thought. 
But the Almighty God, he brought it down. And that's both an encouragement as well as a warning. An encouragement to the church, a warning to the world. God is almighty in power. He tells Babylon, come and sit down in the dust. Orders it, come and sit down in the dust. Sit on the ground, there is no throne. You thought you were something. And he says, you're going to be slaves. You were kings, now you be slaves, servants. You were clothed, but now you be naked. This God is almighty in power. Nothing and no one can withstand him. He will do what he has to do. And so to us, to his, his people, his church, so many encouragements from this. God has all power to do all that he pleases. And that means that he will sustain us as a church. He will keep us. And dear friends, even in terms of gospel outreach, we need not be afraid. Afraid of people on the door? Why would you be afraid of a man compared to God? God has sent you to go. I remember many years ago, 20, perhaps 30 years ago, actually. Time flies by so quickly. 30 years ago, we went with a friend in a local church in London and knocked on a door. And this big man came out very, very big, with tattoos everywhere. And looking fierce and looked at us and gruffly said, what do you want? And we were frightened. We said, Ooh, what are we going to say to this man? Are you going to say anything about sin? He might give us some punch or something. And we plucked up courage and shakily gave him a few tracts and to our surprise he was the most gentle of souls and he listened i imagine if we had said oh no we're not going to speak to him let's get out of here god goes before us he's almighty even that big man was able to be tamed and God is able to tame bigger things. And so Christians shouldn't be afraid of speaking the gospel. You go out on the streets. Oh, they'll come and arrest us. So? Oh, but I'll be in jail. And? We live in a democracy. You've got the rights to speak in public. Yes, you do it in a way that is not rude but at the same time speak the truth we shouldn't be afraid of any pronouncements against the church our god is almighty in power in wisdom in knowledge in salvation all we need do is fall on our knees and then obey trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. This is what God told me. This is what I'll do. I will trust him. I will obey him. He is the almighty one. And he will bring down the proud. And he'll make a way for you. He'll make a way for us as his church. And those that oppose him, he will judge. His judgment oftentimes can be sudden. 
dear friends, there is none other God like our God. He is superlative excellent. He is magnificent beyond all telling. He is supremely God, and none can withstand him. God, he possesses all things, he is possessed by nothing. Why should we fear? Why should we tremble? Why should we despair? Why should we be frightened? Why, dear friends, do we worry even over the smallest of things? We sometimes worry about things that are so insignificant. And yet we have this mighty God who is concerned for us, concerned for us in the big things and in the small things. Concerned for us when we are young and when we are old. Concerned for us when we are strong and when we are weak. Concerned for us when we are well and when we are ill. Concerned for us regardless of who we are, where we are, what's happening to us, what stage of life we've reached. Dear friends, we can hold on knowing that we have such a unique God. There is no God like this God. All the other gods of all the other religions are false gods. They have no relationship with their gods. There is only one God who relates with his people. And he deals with them day after day, hour after hour, moment after moment. Dear friends, our time's run out. Oh, may we trust in this God. May we lean upon him. And may we remember once again, we serve the independent, self-existing, almighty God. And we can lean upon him. Amen.